from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. We're going to start. Um, welcome to Pre Preservation Week at the Library of Congress. Um, this is uh, the first day of Preservation Week here at the library. It started yesterday officially uh, across the country. Um, and at the library, we have six total events this week um, and an online exhibition, which uh, Monica from the Veterans History Project is going to talk to you about. So uh, I don't want to take too much time, but I wanted to. Well, that's disturbing slow computer. I did want to let you know how you can find out about our other events this week. I printed out the library's press release um, and all the handouts are on that marble table where we would also like you to sign in. And uh, then you can see the full listing of our events. But if you want to do it online, if you just go to the library's website, loc.gov, on the left side are news from the library and the hyperlink for the library's press release on Preservation Week is right on the front page. And so that's what I've printed out for you. So you can either look at it online or you can uh, pick up a hard copy. Um, today, we will have um, four speakers. Um, Monica from the Veterans History Project, Erin from uh, Digital Preservation, Dana from Conservation, and Greta from Conservation as well. And I will let them do fuller introductions. Thank you. We hope you enjoy our program. So how many of you actually know about the Veterans History Project? Show of hands. OK, about half and half. That's not too bad. The Veterans History Project, I'm going to do a quick overview. So for those of you, um, including staff members who already know this, please bear with me. We've been around since October of 2000. And uh, the reason that that's true is because there was unanimous, believe it or not, legislation put into place at that time by Congress creating the Library of Congress Veterans History Project in the American Folklife Center. And the idea is to get individuals to interview and record the first person experiences of the veterans in their lives and their communities and submit those to this important national repository at the Library of Congress, the Veterans History Project. To date, we get about 100 to 150 of these collections per week that individuals and organizations have gathered together to create and to send to us which means we have about 86,000 plus collections at the moment. It's a number we're very proud of, but there are 22 million veterans. <laughs> so 86,000, 22 million, we need your help. And I ha get the opportunity, I'm very lucky, to share this information with people all the time, all over the country, in person, through video teleconferences, on the phone, and what always happens, and I don't care if they're Nobel laureates or if they're um, your first grade teacher, it doesn't seem to matter. What they hear is Veterans History Project, the story of the veteran in my life, and then they go off. And so by the time I finish talking five, 10 minutes later, an hour later, it depends, they then say, oh, what you need to do is come interview my Aunt Muriel. Because Aunt Muriel was a whack, and she did this, and she did the other thing. And I say, remember that part where the legislation was about you interviewing the veteran in your life and submitting that interview to the Library of Congress? That's what has to happen. We have a very small staff, and we cannot send somebody to go interview Aunt Muriel. That's not how it works. So is everybody with me on that concept? OK, great. So you're here today because presumably you're interested in learning about how to preserve um, the military history in your family or items in your family. And uh, one way to do that is through some of the techniques you'll be learning about this week and that are available on our website. But I think the best way for you to do that is to do it through us. So you'll send us the originals, and you'll keep beautiful copies for yourself and your family. And the reason I think that is because we are the professionals in preserving fantastic originals. I'm going to show you a little bit about the website and then tell you why you want to send us those originals, because I can already see some skepticism on some of your faces. So I'll start with the website first. 
Is that okay, Clay? Can you hear me? Great. So, here's the Veterans History Project website. And this is a great portal for you to find what you need to know to participate with us. Up here in the right hand corner is where you get to our 15 minute video. That requires real player. If that's a problem for you, you can find us on YouTube and also on iTunes U. It's 15 minutes. It is a little more in depth than I'll get into today about exactly what we accept, why we accept it, what we do with it, and how you can participate. What I really want to show you so that you can spend some time perusing it on your own is our Preservation Week feature, which my esteemed colleague here, Rachel Telford, helped put together. Um, she's somebody who works with our collections and uh, stabilizes them, preserves them, makes sure that they are what they need to be and puts professional in the word professional for us here at the library. So these two stories are really fantastic and I encourage you to take a look at them. Um, the rest of them are awesome also, <laughs> as, you, as you go down. I'm, I'm particularly attached to the first one, the Albert John Carpenter story. And, and this is my bit of evidence for you. I need to move quickly to allow time for the other speakers. But I do want to tell you two quick stories to prove to you why it is you need to send your originals to the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. The first is the Albert John Carpenter collection. This gentleman's daughter-in-law sent us his collection. and. Um, we were able to share some information about it online. And when we did so, she wanted to make a correction for us about um, something we had said online. So we corrected it, and then she wrote us back, and she said, oh, and by the way, thank you so much for existing, essentially, because um, without you, without the Veterans History Project, this amazing diary from World War I was kept in a box in the family closet with the family Bible in the hallway. And this closet was completely flooded by Hurricane Rita. And if I hadn't sent it to you, it would no longer be available for anybody to see, let alone my family. And now because of the Veterans History Project, we have nice digital copies of it and we know that the original is safe with you. I lied, I'm going to tell you two stories. The second story, we have um, a historical society who will remain nameless because I don't want to embarrass them, but they are very professional in what they do. They're in Georgia, and they're incredibly wonderful people. They've been doing this for a long time, but as with a lot of these places, it's from the heart, so the gentleman who runs it keeps most of the collections actually in his house. He has a home office. He was here visiting with me, talking to me about our originals policy, and he wanted to know, you know, why do we have to have the originals? The veterans don't want to give up the originals. The historical societies, the museums, they don't want to give up the originals. Why should they send them to the Library of Congress? It's so far away. It's in Washington, D.C. And I said, Bob, and that is his real name. I said, Bob, these are the reasons why. And I went through how we stabilize them and make sure they're for posterity. Well, we're having our conversation, and he comes to admit to me he's living out of a hotel. And he's been doing so for a few months. Well, Bob, why are you living out of a hotel? Oh, we had a house fire, <laughs> he says. A house fire ravaged the house where the home office is. Now, fortunately, the home office was spared. That section of the house was spared. But he had a house fire. It's been a couple hundred years since we've had a fire here at the library. So another good reason to go ahead and send us the originals. One last thing to consider. Sometimes people in institutions and places get concerned about um, making sure that they've done it right, that they've compiled the information right, and so they'll set it aside in a closet, or they'll set it aside on a desk, or in a cabinet drawer. And the next thing you know, something happens, and then something else happens, and then that person gets a new job, or run over by a bus, or something happens, and then that collection is lost, and nobody knows why it was in the file cabinet, and then it, it ends up in the trash. We do have people calling us saying, I found this in a yard sale. I found this in a dumpster. You know, can I send it to you? So if you're the steward of something, think really carefully about whether or not um, it deserves to be uh, stored here for posterity. So just two more things about the project itself. It's a problem with being short and moving around a lot. Two more things about the project itself. Please pay attention to
our scope and figure out how it is to participate here under how to participate. Here's all the information you need. And I'm going to go back and show you about the project. So you get some information there about how that works. And then finally, under the how to participate, more about what we collect. This handy dandy guide gives you everything you need to know um, for what we require to be part of the Veterans History Project. I think I have like two seconds to take a couple of questions before I pass the baton on. Yeah. What fits into veteran? In that mm, thank you. That's a great question. So we accept um, American veterans. They don't have to be citizens, but who served for the U.S. from World War One through the current collections. And you're saying World War One? We lost the last World War One person. It's true, but people are finding diaries and journals and letters, and we want collections of those, ten or more originals of those. And uh, so sometimes people say, "Well, what about Cold War warriors?" We also take those. They are not spelled out in our scope, but we'll take them. And we'll take civilians who served in professional support of the war effort. Oh, you, do you also provide information on how to find some of those records? Sure. We have a fantastic database. And please note that they, it is somebody who will have had to have participated. So the database is not all inclusive. It is only our collections. And this is how you get to it here. Search the veterans collections. And these click boxes give you different opportunities, including is it a digitized collection? About 13,000 of our collections are fully digitized. Um, is there a transcript? We do not require transcripts, so some have them, some don't. And these fields also give you some opportunities over here. The other place you can look at our collections is similar to this feature we have over here, the Preservation Week feature. We always have a feature here in Experiencing War. And this one is the last in our series about Vietnam, but you'll see that we actually have um, about uh, 37 of these uh, collections. Sorry, I'm getting from our director, pardon me, 39 of those collections. One related question. Sure. Do you, do you cross-reference what you have with what other agencies have? For example, uh, State Department, Immigration, and so on. Because they appear to have some stuff that isn't published. No. Mostly about my own family, one of whom came here during the war, and there's no record of his appearance until he became a citizen. Yeah. But he was on war business, so somebody's got that record. Yeah, I would try NARA or the State Department, as you say. Our, our scope, our mission is truly these fir documents of first person experience, and that's what we yeah, have. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll take one more, and then I really should turn it over. Any others? Thank you so much for your time and your attention this afternoon. I'd like to introduce um, Aaron Engel, who's here to talk about digital preservation, right? Yeah? Thank you, Aaron. Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming today to the Preservation Week event. Um, we're really excited to see so many of you here today. So let me just pull up the PowerPoint. Can you hear me OK? So um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, we're going to start with preserving digital photos and then Dana from Conservation is going to talk about preserving your traditional photos. So we'll take questions at the end, so please keep in mind um, anything you may want to ask uh, um, during, but we'll take questions at the end. Okay. So what I'm going to go over today is just talking about the nature of digital photos and why they require special care, just as you would um, take care of your traditional photos that um, you have at home and your photo albums. Um, but these digital items um, are different, have different qualities and nature. And so I'll talk a little bit about why you need to take action to care for them. And uh, to do that, I'll, give, I'll go over some four basic steps for saving your personal digital photos. So chances are some of the traditional personal collections you have at your, in, at your home may look something like this. They may be your letters, journals, correspondence, um, scrapbooks, um, 
physical photos. So these are items that you can hold in your hands and you can look at. Um, and you don't need a computer to look at them. You don't need hardware or software to know what they are, to, to see what that moment was that you captured in time. And for the most part, these items are pretty reliable. They last for a long time. You could put them in a shoebox or in a box, um, put them on a shelf, um, put them in a closet, which aren't the best preservation strategies. But, you know, you could take them down 20 years later and you would know what they, what they would be or what they were. But digital photos um, are different. Um, for the most part, we're, our lives are largely online today, largely digital. So we have our devices, our mobile phones, our cameras, um, and we can take snapshots in time. And we may want, we may care about these. We may be interested in saving all the stuff we're creating today, all the, the, the snapshots that we're taking. We're interested in sharing them. We share them over email, um, text messaging. We have websites and blogs. And so that's really great, but we have what ends up becoming these unmanaged digital collections, personal digital collections. So besides the, our personal collections, um, there's challenges to managing them and knowing what we have. There's actually some danger to digital materials, any type of digital item, these files. And that is technology obsolescence. So to be able to view a digital photo, you need hardware and software. And so over time, we know the thing that changes is technology. We're always going to have new hardware, new devices, new storage containers. Um, well, we always have different types of software in which we can view photos. Um, there's always going to be an upgrade, different versions. And so to be able to access your digital photos, you need these, these, two, com these two things. Um, but also, what we're thinking about a lot today, and some of us in the room may actually be online a lot, is using um, online storage services. And those are businesses. So just like any business, it can go out of business. So this, the idea of, of obsolescence of, of the actual physical media in which you're using to create your photos or to save them, um, but also the services in which we're using today to um, share those uh, photos, to save them. Um, we just need to be aware that, that in the digital world, um, we have to, to be vigilant and know that if we want these, um, our digital collections to last longer into the future, we need to take some action now to manage them over time. So managing your, your, digital, your personal digital photo collection um, is actually um, something that we may not think about. It's, there's no equivalent to the digital shoebox um, that you can just stick on a shelf and you'll be able to access. So there's no guarantee that you'll be able to access your photos in 20 years, like you would be able to open a box, a uh, shoebox. So today I'm just going to talk about some basic steps, um, personal digital archiving steps, th and that you can follow to help save your digital photos. So here at the library, um, we developed some personal digital archiving guidance that is very high level, uh, non-technical in nature. So if you have a project in which you're looking um, for you're here today, you're actually looking to start to save your personal digital photos. Um, just know that you may need to um, go through additional steps for your own personal project at home. So these are uh, starting points um, just to help you s get thinking about um, some actions that you would need to take. So those four steps are um, identifying where you have your digital photos, deciding which of those you want to save, um, organizing the ones you've decided to save, and then actually managing your collection over time. So I'll walk through these steps um, briefly with, with you. So when we talk about identifying, it seems really simple, right? Like you know you've got photos on your computer and your laptop, but do you also have photos on your, that you take with your camera, your smartphone? Do you transfer these photos to your, to your laptop or your computer? Do you have other devices? 
um, f uh, you know, tablets? Are you, do you have a website that you're keeping photos, um, uh, that you upload photos to? Are you on social networking sites? Um, or do you keep your collection in the cloud? So all of this to say is you may have multiple copies of the same photos in different places, or you may only have one copy of an important photo, for example, on a social networking site that you may be interested in keeping. So just knowing where, where your, your photos are is uh, the first step. The next step is actually deciding which of those photos you would want to save. Um, you can save all of them, you can save some of them, um, or just a few, a few. It's really up to you, and this is where you want to actually think about the type of photo collection you're saving. So um, a lot of people, for the most part, just back up their files and back up their photos, which is great, and hopefully we're all doing that in this room. But the idea of creating a collection, it's more thoughtful. It's, it's something that represents um, something that's meaningful to you at a point in time. And so, um, as you can see from this, this example here, <coughs> there's three different photos from a wedding. Um, and for the most part, they pretty much all look the same. Um, one's in black and white, so that was a copy of one that I had made. But do I really in need to save all three of these photos to actually re remember the event? For my personal strategy, no. I think I would just want to keep one copy to be able to pass that on or to, or to remember this event because um, that's, what's the most, that's the most important copy to me. And the other thing to think about, too, is if you are creating a collection to pass down through your family, if you're just backing up your, your, your collection, um, would someone in your family actually really want to go through 800 pictures of photos that you took at one event? So another thing to keep in mind, and it's okay to, d to weed or delete any of your, f your photos if you're not interested in passing them on. The next step is organizing the photos that you've decided to save. So after this thoughtful process, here's um, actual action that you could take. And the first step is creating a file directory onto your com on your computer um, in which you're going to be saving all the digital photos that you've chosen. And you can call it something simple like my archive or my collection. So within that folder structure, your file directory structure, is you actually want to create subfolders in which you would organize all of your digital photos. So with this example, you can see that um, the folder structure is organized by year. And then within that folder structure, there's examples of how you can save it. So you may have s categories as simple as family, friends, or school events. Or you may, have, um, you may decide to organize your photos or other digital materials by different types of content of things that you're saving. But the thing here is what you want to remember is uh, pick a strategy, stick with it, um, because that's something that um, uh, would be consistent over time. That would make it easy for you or easy for someone else to, to remember if they're looking for your collection. Part of organizing your digital photos is actually labeling them or renaming them with descriptive, something descriptive. So. Um, when you take a photo with a camera or a smartphone, the camera automatically um, give, names the photo some, something like this. It, it might be a combination of letters or, or numbers, and it doesn't mean anything. You actually have to open this file. You have to open up this, this file to know that it's a photo, but you don't know what the content actually is. So to, a, helpful, a helpful tip here is actually naming it with something um, where you would know what it is by looking at it or have an idea of what it's about before, um, without having to open it. So uh, in this respect, you want to try to keep a uh, consistent naming convention here too. Um, and sometimes, depending on your photo organizing software that you're using, you can actually tag photos that would help you find or discover, search through your collection. Another part of organizing um, is after you've gone through all of this work of creating your collection, your archive, is you want to create an inventory. And so this is something as simple as a summary description of um, what's actually in the archive. So 
um, where, where the archive is actually stored, how many copies of your archive that you have, um, if there's any special information needed to access it. So for example, if you need, um, if you have a login and password to get onto your personal computer, you want to make sure that's recorded here. Um, because what you're going to do with this is print this out and keep it with your important papers. So if um, anything, um, if anyone needs to look through your collection or access your digital information or photos, um, they will be able to do so. So the last step is actually managing over time your digital collection and that is um, making copies. Make at least two copies of your archive and you want to store those on different types of media. So one copy can be on your laptop or your computer, another can be on external media such as um, an external hard drive, uh, CDs or DVDs. Um, even if you have another copy on a flash drive, that's better than nothing. Um, or you can also um, use online cloud storage too as another option. Um, what's important about this step is, um, is keeping those copies in different locations. So if you're actually using a physical media, you want to make sure that the external hard drive in which your, your second copy is not sitting right next to your computer because if something actually happens at home, for example, a disaster, maybe with a cup of coffee, um, both of the one copy is, is in a far away uh, different location and, and hopefully safe. Um, as part of this too, you want to think about checking your collection um, every year or so. If you're adding photos to your, your collection, you want to go in there and just spot check, maybe open a couple of the files to make sure that they're not corrupted. Or if you have upgraded to a new computer and maybe new, new software, photo viewing software, you want to make sure that you can open up these, these files. Um, and part of this too is um, moving your collection to a new storage media every five years or so. Um, we say every five years is a good rule of thumb because we know that um, storage media have different lifespans. So depending if you're going to use an external hard drive um, or if you use CDs or DVDs, there's, these generally have short lifespans. These are, after all, physical media. Um, so not only is it, is it the type of media that you're using, depending on whether it's um, how durable it might be, um, actually how we handle and store that media has an has a impact on the lifespan of it. And so again, um, you know, every five years is a good rule maybe, or every time you get a new computer, you might want to upgrade if you're using any type of external storage. Some other things to think about. Um, if, you're, if you have a, a very large collection and you're interested um, and, and you've done this to pass it on to your family, you may want to um, uh, address this maybe in your uh, will or testament because if it, it is a, a physical, important, valuable thing to you and that way you can pass it on to someone to give them and trust them into the care to have it. Um, passwords, if you are using any type of online service, um, your logins and passwords are going to be extremely important. So it's good to, again, keep that on your, um, make sure you have those listed on some type of inventory list. And of course, um, if you store, uh, or if you're using social media to share any of your photos, just know that some sites, um, when you're, if you upload them and if you try to download them and get them back, they may um, alter, fi alter files and maybe change some of the descriptive information that travels with the photo. So again, here are the uh, steps. Um, identify where you have your digital photos, decide which, which you want to save, organize them, and then manage them over time. And the idea here is you're actively doing something, um, whether you're organizing or um, over time, um, making sure that the, the media and the storage, the way in which you store your photos are, are kept up to date. So um, here are a list of resources, uh, or where you can find some of our resources on personal digital archiving guidance. Um, we have some videos that go into more detail about um, archiving digital photos here, and on our blog we talk a lot about personal digital archiving perspectives. Um, and we also share a lot of information on Twitter and Facebook. I have some handouts over here that talk more, uh, that list the steps and also have some supplemental um, information too. And I think I've actually 
gone over in my time a little bit, but um, if you have questions, um, I'd be happy to take them after Dana and Greta talk. So, so up now, Dana Hemingway. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Well, that loads. I'm Dana Hemingway. I'm a photograph conservator here at the Library of Congress in the Conservation Division. Um, I've been here for about 10 years, and one of the things I really enjoy doing is talking to people about how to care for their um, family, fo traditional family photographs. And we'll, we'll separate that. Aaron was talking about digital photographs. Um, I'm my specialty is having has a lot more to do with the materials, the the traditional <laughs> photographs, negatives, prints, things like that. over here. Oh, we all know what photographs are, right? Well, it's getting more complicated, obviously, with, with digital photography involved. Uh, but most of us have masses of them at home, um, shots of our family, friends, very important events. <coughs> Since its invention in 1840, photography has gone through many, many changes, uh, using very different materials and very different techniques to make them. Here are just a few of the names. That's only just a few. Photographs were present at the Civil War um, and are today still very in a very important part of our remembrances and documentation of significant events. Uh, they're a very important part of our nation's cultural heritage and can be found in museums and libraries and archives. Believe it or not, photographs are very fragile. Uh, they need special care and attention. Their physical structure and material composition are quite complex. Basically, there are, three, there are a range of things that can happen to photographs in time, and we can separate them into three basic categories. Mechanical damage, chemical, det chemical deterioration, and biological attack. And I'll just highlight them briefly. Physical damage can be the result of rough or inappropriate handling. Um, if something becomes brittle with age, it's very easy to damage it without realizing that's going to happen. Chemical deterioration can affect the image material or the support or even the binding media. Uh, this photograph of a baby on the left shows discoloration and fading of the silver image material. That is probably the result of, of age and improper um, storage condition. The organic dyes um, in color photographs can undergo chemical changes that result in fading or dramatic color shifts, as you can see in the image here of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Basically here you've lost all the cyan and the yellow dye layers that originally brought that to full color, and now it's just magenta. And finally, we add materials to photographs to reinforce, to mend, uh, to attach into albums, but not all those materials we add are benign. The wrong choice can result in staining or fading, Adhesives like rubber cement, in the example on the right, um, rubber cement has been added to the back, uh, and you can see now over time it's migrated to the front of the photograph, uh, disfiguring the image. Um, so be careful of rubber cements and pressure sensitive tapes, because those, those, um, that deterioration is often, can be reduced but not eliminated entirely. And also, finally, much of photography is compri comprised of organic materials such as paper, gelatin, and these are subject to biological attack. Mold can stain paper and gelatin, and rodents and insects can take a bite out of a photograph or the su paper support. There are a few ways, however, to mitigate some of this deterioration and damage, and I'll touch on a few. Perhaps the most important influence on photograph preservation is control of temperature and relative humidity. High temperature raises the rate of all chemical reactions, bad ones as well as ones that we are looking for. Uh, so if you reduce the temperature in storage conditions, you'll reduce those reaction rates. High um, relative humidity um, provides, the, excuse me, provides the moisture necessary for harm, harmful chemical reactions that can lead to silver image deterioration, silver mirroring, image fading, as well as physical distortion. 
Uh, high humidity also leads to the swelling of the, of the gelatin binder. And in the image on the left, you can see where the, um, where the photograph has stuck to the inside of, of a, a glass, the glazing on the photograph. It's right here. So that image is now completely stuck to the glass, and to remove it would damage the photograph. Um, oftentimes, it's good to use a little spacer when you're um, framing photographs. And in the image on the right, um, you can see the, the, the physical distortion in the paper support. That's the result of high relative humidity. Air quality is also very important. Particulates like soot and ash exist in abundance outdoors and can come in through heating or cooling ducts, doors, and windows. Pollution produced by fossil fuels, combustion of cars and engines, and ozone can oxidize silver image material um, in traditional gelatin silver prints and others, and it can turn um, some image materials from a brown or black image to a, an orange or yellow color. In this image you can see down here, this is closer to the image tone of the original photograph, and because of, of oxidants in the air, it's, it's turned to a sort of an orangey-brown color. And that can happen overall. It can happen in sections. Um, but protecting photographs from pollution is, uh, goes a long way to protect that original image, image tone. In the, in, the, in the photograph on the right, you can see here there's an area that's been surface cleaned. Um, and it shows you that there's a level of dust and dirt all over the photograph. And, it's important to clean that off, partly because that dust and dirt, if it accumulates on the photograph, will also lead to damage and deterioration. Um, and in the image on the upper left, you can see the beginning of the deterioration of the silver image material coming in from the sides. Pollution is affecting the print from the perimeter, and it will just close in if it's not um, put into protective housing and good quality environment. Oops. Next. Light is a well-known culprit for the deterioration of historic materials. Light is a form of energy, and most deterioration from light can be attributed to ultraviolet um, radiation, although it's, uh, visible light is not without its damage as well. The most important thing to know about, know about light is that the damage is cumulative and irreversible. You can see two examples of light damage here. On the left, this is a platinum print um, where the paper background, you can see where the mat has covered up the edge or the perimeter of the photograph. And in the center, it's um, become yellowed uh, through exposure to light. And on the right, uh, the oval mat opening shows you where the color dyes have faded versus what was protected under the mat. Prolonged display can fade images permanently. If you have photographs on display, try to avoid direct sunlight. If possible, rotate your items on display. That will give them a, a prolonged exhibition life over time. For particularly valuable items to you, it's possible these days to get very accurate and wonderful um, facsimiles or reproductions made, digital copies. And these could be put on display, and you can uh, save the original for future generations to enjoy. Storage and handling. As we have seen, materials that come into direct contact with photographs can have a significant impact on their physical and chemical condition. These can include sleeves, adhesives, tapes, clips, mounts, um, or matting materials in storage containers. For enclosures, think layers of protection. The more layers that you have, the more protection you have. Boxes not only keep things well organized, but they also keep out light, dust, pollutants, pests, by creating a physical and chemical barrier. You can use vertical or horizontal storage, depending on a number of conditions. Size, having to do with the, whether an item is in an album, um, or if it's fragile enough, it might need to be in horizontal storage. Otherwise, um, you can get high density storage in vertical upright boxes. It's important to look for supplies that are acid-free, lignin-free, made of, of good quality paper and cardstock or plastic. And it could be helpful if you look in um, supplier uh, catalogs if you find that they have actually paid attention to and, and done what's called a physical uh, photographic activity test. It's a national standard that can be you can use to evaluate whether uh, housing materials, storage containers will actually cause um, deterioration of photographs themselves. 
There's information about that on our website. It's called the PAT for short. So if it says it in the supply catalog, passes the PAT, it's passed at one time or another, but there, it means that the company is actually paying attention to that sort of thing. Um, again, it's important to provide layers of protection. So the next layer down would be folders. Folders provide protection as well as support for individual items or groups of items. So it's important, as you can see, to avoid slumping. Um, that will cause physical distortion, and with adequate support, they can remain upright in the box. Sleeves. Ideally, photographs should be sleeved uh, individually to increase protection from handling and damage, abrasion, dust, dirt, harmful oxidat um, oxidative gases in the air. Your, your choice is basic choices between paper and plastic. In many cases, it's not practical to sleeve each and every one, um, but it's important to give it some sort of protection. Let's see if I have uh, papers. Paper is it has its advantages in that it um, it keeps light out, um, and it's less expensive than than plastic materials. But the advantage of plastic is that you can actually see through. You don't have to open it up to handle it, so you, it decreases handling if you're using plastic. There are just uh, several ca couple caveats with plastic. If you have an item that's beginning to flake, the binder is flaking. There's a static charge that can be created with plastic, um, such as polypropylene or polyethylene, polyester. Um, so you want to avoid using those when you've got items that have surfaces that are delicate. And of course, good handling techniques are very, very important. Though much attention has been given here to the proper environment and physical storage of photographs, it's really when an item is being handled that it's at its greatest risk. A photograph that's rested in archival storage for decades may be damaged irreparably by just a careless moment. Not something someone intends, but if you're not careful when you're handling physical items, you can damage them very, very easily. Nobody wants that to happen, but it can happen. Here's some basic guidelines to help you with handling photograph. It's important to handle them one at a time, but use both hands to support it. Can't tell you how often I see people picking up photographs with one hand, even if they're little. Try to remember to pick them up from both sides. One side or another may be weak. There may be a point at which it's, it's already been weakened and you want to make sure to support it thoroughly. Um, stack items carefully in smaller groups, uh, small, smaller ones on top of larger ones. Don't bend or force a photograph in and out of a sleeve, as you see on the upper left. Um, you can break or crack the emulsion. Use a support board to carry photographs, especially ones that are brittle, as you can see in the upper right. Use pencils when working near or marking the back of photographs. Inks can stain, um, as well as fade image material. See on the lower left, that's an inscription on the back of the photograph. It's actually migrated through to the front, fading, fading the image material itself. Um, and wear gloves or have very clean hands when working with photographs. Fingerprints like the ones you see in the picture in the lower right can, um, can actually fade the photograph and that's not um, reversible. Here are some basic, um, both of these uh, websites have a great deal of information, our own as well as the American Institute for Conservation. Um, those are their URLs there. They also provide links to other, other resources, but I would start there for information about caring for photographs or any kind of material. Um, and if you have any questions, um, again, as I said, save them for the end. But now I will introduce Greta Glazier, who's going to talk about her treatment of a particular photograph album in the conservation lab. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out today. Today I want to talk to you about an album that I treated w under the supervision of our book conservator Claire Diekel and my supervising photograph conservator Dana Hemingway. And this is just to give you a little idea about some of the things that uh, go on here at the Conservation Division of the Library of Congress. This was really a, a great album to work on. It's World War I era and the binding is a modern post binding. This is something that somebody could have purchased on their own rather than uh, have taken it to a binder and, and done custom. This isn't a one-off type of binding. 
but it is customized. The person who made it, Lieutenant Rex Bixby, used parts of his uniform on the front cover and his dog tags that were used in the binding. These posts here at the uh, bottom of the screen were inserted into these holes and then his dog tag was looped through the posts to hold the album together. It has a lot of great ephemera in it, things that he collected during his service, uh, documents of his service, newspaper clippings about himself and his colleagues, and all of these great photographs with inscriptions that he either put on the photographs with his own hand or newspaper clippings that he cut out kind of like a ransom note in a way. I wanted to show you this little dog because I think it's the cutest thing in the world. All men fear me. And one of the other strange things in there is this button that'll pop up later. Somebody at one point in time had used what we call pressure sensitive tape to uh, do some triage repairs on the album. I would encourage you that if you want your things to last for a very long time, please do not use things like scotch tape, duct tape, any, any type of tape that doesn't need water or heat on your personal items. And this was a really cool find too. It's actually a cellulose nitrate negative that somebody had taped into the album, but it appears to have belonged with the album. So once I removed the tape very carefully, I could scan it and reverse the image to make a positive, and that button pops up again. I, I'm pretty sure that's the button from his uniform that he's wearing right there. The first step in a lot of treatments is usually cleaning, and we have several methods of doing this. One is just using a soft brush. We can also use white vinyl eraser in either a block form or crumbs, and sometimes even cotton swabs that we roll ourselves with water or solvents. In this case, all I needed was a soft brush to just remove the surface dirt and grime. And I wanted to show you this too. Sometimes on a photograph, you might consider removing ink splats like this, but not in this case because it shows the object's use or it's, it's kind of a, um, it's part of the object now. It's part of the object's history. So it was not necessary to remove that. The photographs themselves in some cases needed a little help. This is one photograph that was found detached and just kind of stuck in the back of the album with actually pressure sensitive tape. I found where the object, where the photograph went in the album because it had been detached from its left edge. And by matching up the images, I could figure out where it belonged, which page it belonged to. And I'm not exactly sure uh, what the image, what's going on in the image. I know that at one point in Bixby's career, he was injured and thought, thought dead, but not really dead. This could be him lying down in the stretcher. So to repair the photograph, I lifted the existing smaller edge from the album page that it was on. Uh, and repaired the album, the page of the album itself, reattached the photograph, the two separate pieces of the photograph on the back with an archival paper and wheat starch paste, and also added in some extra bits to make up for the uh, parts of the photograph that were missing, also with archival paper. And to reattach the photograph to the page itself, I didn't want to put it back in the same place where it had already been adhered to the page. For one, because it broke along that edge in the first place because that's where somebody had been flexing it to get a better view of the photograph underneath. So instead I made what's called a hinge out of archival paper and attached that to the upper edge. So now if somebody wants to look at the photograph underneath, the hinge is what's going to be flexing instead of the photograph. The pages themselves also had been damaged for the same reason, they, they were broken where they were flexing. And this type of black album paper that's really common in early, early 20th century albums tends to be very brittle and, and doesn't withstand much physical action. So to repair them, I made uh, guards in a way out of an archival paper, paper that I toned with acrylic paints and let dry before I uh, attached them to the pages and then used wheat starch paste and left them under weights so that I had a, a reinforced strengthened guard that would be on the binding edge of the album. 
And all of these extra ephemeral pieces in the, in the album, like the newspapers, were very brittle as well and folded up so that you couldn't read them very well. And if we want a researcher to have access to that information, I made preservation copies on 100% rag or 100% cotton paper so that you can read the information without having to handle the items themselves. And the last step in the treatment is just a simple rebinding. We couldn't reuse the old posts, for one, because they were ferrous or iron-containing and iron tends to rust with moisture. So instead, we put aluminum post bindings, new aluminum post bindings, where the original holes were. And to tone them back a little bit, just so that they don't stand out too much, we used acrylic spray paint. We do not often use spray paint in our conservation treatments, but this was a special case. And also, I painted them not while they were in the post binding, but separate from the album. And we left the back untoned, uh, for one, just to not make work, but two, so you can see what's original and what's not original. And the very, very last step, this is really fun for us here because we have a box cutting machine so we can make boxes to spec and it's really, really fun to watch, is that we made a box for the album in all its pieces. And all of the ephemera got put in separate sleeves in a folder that's going to stay with the album so that if anybody does need to see the original item, they will have access to it, but uh, the polyester sleeves should prevent damage during handling. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions for me or my colleagues, please ask. Um, questions from anyone? Yeah. The newspapers that were on the, uh, that were on the scrap, and a lot of those, um, what, in this case, you could take the scrap apart, so were you scanning the without detaching them from the page? Oh, sure. So the question is about preserve, uh, preserving the photo, the, excuse me, preserving the newspapers and photocopying them. Uh, some of them were adhered to the pages of the album, in which case I would have to scan them while they're still attached to the album because I didn't want to take any of them off. Some of them were already detached, and which made scanning quite a bit easier. And instead of trying to figure out where any of those things went, I did not rehear them back into the pages. Now, did you, did you scan them as TIFF, JPEG, PDF? Is, is there a standard? Oh, no, I, I wasn't making digital scans of those. I was using a copy machine okay. to copy them onto. So you did not try to, to scan, digitally scan them? That's correct. So, um, the, uh, you could. I, yeah, I, I very well could, and I could even use the copies to make digital files of, of the newspaper clippings. Is there a standard of the three PDF JPEG? You might be able to answer that for the library. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, the, um, for personal uh, consumer scanned copies, I guess I should back up and say, that um, scanning or converting from originals, uh, original items um, to a digital file um, is a separate process which was left out of um, my presentation. But if you're scanning, um, whether it's photos or generally photos at the consumer level, it's um, JPEG. But you can scan them at TIFF. It's, TIFFs are larger files, which means that they're going to take up more storage space, which means if you're doing a lot of scanning, um, you're just going to need more storage space. So, so those are some considerations that you would want to play with. But generally, if um, uh, if you're going to uh, scan um, a, a good sort of base rule is scanning at 300 dpi dots per inch, which is, is we say, good enough. Um, some people want to scan at a higher resolution depending on what they may want to do with it. Um, but I actually have a scanning handout over here. It's called Scanning Your Personal Collections that walks through some of the steps that um, you would want to think about and goes through some terminology um, about scanners. And that would, would maybe help you make a decision that's best for you and your collection. So you wouldn't suggest to check out the, um, uh, PDF? Uh, you could do PDF. Um, 
but generally, if you're doing photos, um, JPEG is, is, is a good, it's, it's, a, it's a standard that's around, it's being supported by the community right now. So um, that's generally consumer level a good one. Just, just an addendum, if you mm -hmm. don't scan and you use PDF, you'll have a devil of a time editing anything that you scan. But if you, if you, but if you use JPEG, at least you can make a copy of that original and mess with it and mm -hmm. not worry that you messed it up. But you might want to correct colors. Right, yeah, it depends if you're making a copy to, to pass on in view or if you actually want to do some, if you're using photo editing software at some point to do it. I have a question about newspaper clippings. They, they like to fall apart because they're usually on acid paper anyway. Mm -hmm. How do you stabilize them? Uh, newspaper? Do you have a paper? Well, I'm a photographic conservator, but I might be able to field this one. Um, <laughs> there, there are many ways. One of the ways in which Greta was able to at least um, copy them and put them onto um, archival paper so that it, they can be read. But the, but the, um, the actual samples themselves um, can be taken to a photograph, I mean, a paper conservator. Um, they can undergo and be washed to remove some of the acidity. Um, or they can be encapsulated uh, in polyester um, with a support paper behind it, so it, it, it actually helps to support the brittleness of the paper itself, depending on, the, there's, there's mostly those two d different ways. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. I've got some stuff falling apart, and I hesitate to pick it up. I would also recommend looking at the both um, the library's website as well as on caring for your family memorabilia, um, not just photographs, there's another section in there, but also the American Institute for Conservation website, um, the specialty group book and paper, there's probably information there on, on how to care for family uh, paper items. Thank you. Paper first one. There you go. Bandwidth may be the the you know the provider in which you're using to upload it, but if you're I mean I have a, I have mm -hmm. a fiber optic kind yeah, of, but they'll take three megabytes, mm -hmm. nine megabits per second maximum. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds it sounds like you have a very large personal collection, and I think um, the larger people's personal collections get, perhaps these companies will address this issue. Um, and so sometimes people may be doing it. One strategy might be. Um, to some some providers do automatic backups every time you add new content to a collection where you can just automatically back it up and it'll go into the cloud. So instead of just doing everything all at once, you can start to do it as you're, for example, taking your photos from your camera to your computer 
and downloading them and then maybe if you're using a, a service provider. Um, so a lot of the steps that I talked about are people who may be doing parts of, parts of um, organizing or managing their collection, but I think a lot of people, if they're doing, um, they're scanning their collections, creating this new content, in addition to, to making a collection with their digital photos now, it's, it really is almost a, a project to think about. And you bring up an excellent point, consideration People about um, I mean, going up. Well, so yeah. 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 So, um, yep. Do you have tips for preserving and digitizing slides? Um, Actually, yes, um, on our website, um, uh, we have um, an extra handout on how to uh, digitize slides or negatives. Um, and it's on, uh, let's see if I can get there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Thanks. So um, on digitalpreservation.gov, you can. Um, find some more information about various, the various different types of formats, types of content. So not only photos, but videos, um, audio files, email, um, digital, personal digital records and websites. And so on our digital photos page, here's some of the um, additional, oh wait, I think um, we have additional um, information about scanning slides, which, oh, here's our handout. Um, so we talk a little bit about here what you want to scan at. Um, a lot of times if you have a personal scanner at home it may have come with an actual slide scanner or you can buy specific scanners, slide scanners. Um, but the general rule um, is scanning at 1900 dpi because they're smaller. So that's, sorry, dots per inch, 1900 dots per inch, because when you want to blow that up, so say, for example, you want to print it out or save it, you can do that in the future. I'd also advocate at that point, once you get them copied, is to, to save the originals, not oh. assume that, that you have a, a digital file now, then that's good enough. It's wonderful to hold on to the original as well. Yes. But that can be a very slow process, can you? have a large number of... It can, yes. Um, well, there are companies that can do this for you, so it's your personal choice if you want to outsource it. Um, but if you want to do it yourself, some strategies, I guess this is where deciding what you want to save comes in, into play. So if you know that there's a certain set of slides, you may want to just select those. Um, but if you want to do everything, um, it's just going to take more of your personal time and effort. So unfortunately, no easy answer there. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we don't um, recommend particular services because they're all very different and you may have a different collection of what you want to do. But um, on our blog, um, on um, blogs.loc.gov slash digital preservation, I actually wrote a blog post called um, um, outsourcing or do it yourself for scanning and things that I would think about when I'm choosing a service. So I can point you, give you that specific address for you. So, so any, yes? I saw something somewhere that said you wear a badge for Yeah, they're, they're going to duke it out. <laughs> well, acid-free, when something is manufactured, it can be manufactured at, at the time it's been made, it can be acid-free or pH neutral. But depending on the content of the materials that they use over time, that can become acidic. So even if something is acid-free at the time that you buy it and use it, if it's not made of, of good quality materials, i.e. Um, lignin-free and a high alpha cellulose content, um, it can become acidic over time. So when you go to um, websites or suppliers that say acid-free, um, just b it's it's buyer beware. You have to be careful of where you where you buy things from. 
um, I would recommend going to um, our, you know, archive companies that well are well known for their archival products, companies that take the time to do the photographic activity test. Um, that answer your question. Well, there is a there is a, a, a pen. It's a pH tester. It, it will mark the item. Um, it will it will leave a mark on the item, um, but it's called a pH pen. And it will if it's acidic, it will turn yellow. If it's if it's still pH neutral or alkaline, it will be purple or blue. And you can pick those up at the um, general archival supply companies. Um, well, I think that's one of the, um, that's what resolution you should scan at. So 1900, I think, is just general. But it also depends on, um, you want to make sure that your scanner, you've actually cleaned your scanner before you've started it. And so with respect to dust on, on negative slides and negatives, I'm not clear, sure, advice on how to, how to treat those. But a lot of times, too, is you may want to do a couple of tests with your scanner and with also the monitor you're using, too, because what you scan at may actually look different on your monitor versus someone else's and also the scanner that you're using, too. So it's, it's, you might want to do a test of higher and lower resolutions for scanning and seeing what you're most comfortable with. But 1900 might be starting. So you might want to go lower if you don't want to see the dust particles, and depending well, on the, the, the quality of it, too. Dust, a couple of things, if you're doing slides and, and um, negatives, is use a, an, an ear syringe. It, it has a, I mean, like I said, it blows puffs air out. Rather than using your breath, it will actually be you know, able to dislodge some, dislodge some dust and particles. Otherwise, a very, very soft brush. Uh, you can buy it. It's a camel hair brush that you can buy from some photographic companies. And that's soft enough to, if you very, very gently um, clean off both sides of the, of the film. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything about plastic that we should be aware of, like with paper acid free? I just see it's been shown oh, yesterday, and I really don't know very much about plastic. So there are some uh, plastics that degrade over time and some that degrade very quickly. We generally use polyester or polyethylene because they're known to have good aging characteristics. And you can find those at uh, any vendor, any archival vendor. And it, they have also, those two plastics have also passed the photo photographic activity test. Um, I would stay away from things that say they have vinyl in them, like polyvinyl chloride, polyvinyl acetate. Uh, those tend to off-gas acids and will embrittle or, or uh, contribute to the degradation of the objects that you're trying to store. Um, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, the URL I just pulled up, they just changed their website today. Um, they have a very good leaflet. Uh, it's printed. Uh, you can get it off the off the internet. You can also get it um, printed from them. Uh, and they talk about storage materials, and they list very clearly um, the different kinds of paper uh, uh, characteristics that you're looking for, as well as for plastics. And let me see if I can just find that for you. Um, storage, storage. Northeast, it's N-E-D-C-C dot org. And it's up on your screen now, Northeast Document Conservation Center. And when you go there, you want to look at their preservation leaflets, which are under free resources, preservation leaflets. And um, here, they've done a very good job of explaining why you want to look for certain things when you buy your preservation supplies. Um, this leaflet 4.4, storage enclosures, talks about chemical stability, um, why that's important, the alkaline buffer, um, here, plastics, um, and what you're looking for when you buy plastics. Um, so that's a good resource. So. Uh, stabilizing slides. Slide emulsions get messed up over time. I have many that are, but 
Uh, I think it's mainly from handling, which shouldn't have happened. Well, it could. But there's also um, chemical instabilities in the slide materials themselves. So uh, Cold storage is, or cooler cold storage is the best way to slow down those chemical reactions that are sort of inherent at room temperature, both the base, if it's, it's cellulose acetate, or if it's color dyes, um, which many of our color negatives are. Um, they're all color dyes. Anyway, if you put them into cold storage, it will just slow down that process and buy you some time um, to copy and migrate them onto other media. But if it's the emulsion, if it's gotten mucky or the fingerprints and things like that, that can be cleaned off before, um, before you digitize. And Some of it actually looks like mold. It looks like it's just spreading could be. out. From well, well, could be mold if it, it's been in a high humidity environment. And in that case, I would be very careful. I would consult a conservator about that because mold, first of all, has um, health risks for the for the person actually working with the materials, but it can also mold can also render the gelatin if it's if it's a gelatin binder, it can actually denature it, and then um, if you're not careful, you can lose the entire image. Questions? All right. Well, thank you. I think Mary just wanted to close out. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to um, remind you again that we have a full week of programming. And tomorrow's program, which is a lunchtime program, is a screening of this 2011 film, The Movies That Make America. It's about the history of the National Film Registry, which is here at the Library of Congress. Um, it was uh, profiled in the Library of Congress magazine, the last issue, not, not the current issue, but the previous one, the one with President Obama's second inauguration on the cover. And I actually have a few printouts of the article on the left, if you, uh, on the handout table over there if you're interested. Um, so we will be screening this film. The librarian is featured in this film, and it will be introduced by the Director of Preservation um, who just stepped out, uh, as well as um, one of, uh, one of the um, audiovisual specialists from the National Audiovisual Conservation Center, who is also featured in the film. So we hope that you join us tomorrow, and then you can see our full listing of programs this week um, on the press release. Thank you for coming today. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.